All righty. Good evening and welcome to um, the virtual California African American Museum. My name is Alexandra Mitchell. I'm the manager of education and public programs here at CAM. I want to uh, welcome back our viewers who have been with us for all of last season. Welcome back. I hope you had a lovely, uh, restful and prosperous break. Um, to those of you joining us for the first time, welcome to the family. We're happy to have you for tonight's conversation, which is sure to be a special treat to the CAM audience. Um, I, before I begin, I want to um, invite you all to our um, upcoming public programs. We have our annual King Day celebration on this coming Monday, uh, which is sure to be very special. Of course, typically we welcome over 3,000 people to the museum under normal circumstances. Of course, with COVID, we've had to pivot, um, but we have not slacked on quality um, in our pivoting. Uh, we'll have a lovely welcome from the ICO, the Youth Choir of Los Angeles, um, first thing in the morning, followed by our King Day study group, um, a lovely panel, as well as a family reading workshop. So there'll be something for everybody. We'll hope, we hope that you visit the website as well as um, Eventbrite to register for Zoom information for that particular program. Um, tonight, um, we're obviously joined by Dr. Carl Hart and Dr. Carla Shedd uh, in his new book, uh, drug use for grown-ups, chasing liberty in the land of fear. Dr. Carl L. Hart, the Ziff Professor of Psychology in the Department of Psychology and Psychiatry at Columbia University, argues that the greatest damage from drugs flows from their being illegal. Hart draws on decades of research and his own personal experience to argue that the criminalization <laughs> sorry, my dog is barking, and demonization of drugs, not drug use themselves have been a tremendous scourge on America, not least in reinforcing this country's enduring structural racism. Um, tonight, they discuss this controversial position. Um, Dr. Carl, uh, Carla Shedd, excuse me, the Associate Professor of Psychology and Urban Education at the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, uh, whose research and teaching focuses on education, criminalization, and criminal justice, race and ethnicity, law, social inequality, and urban policy. Shed's first book, Unequal City, Race, Schools, and Perceptions of Justice, has won multiple academic awards, including the prestigious C. Wright Mills Award, which is given to the top social science book in the field of social inequality. Unequal City examines Chicago public school students' perceptions of injustice and contact with police within and across various schools and neighborhoods and deeply probes the intersections of race, place, education, and the expansion of the American carceral state. Tonight, Dr. Shedd will lead the conversation with Dr. Hart, who, as we have mentioned, is at Columbia University and is a neuropsychopharmacologist, make sure I get that right, and the first Black professor and the first Black chair in the sciences at an Ivy League school. No easy feat. In addition to his work at Columbia, Hart is a research scientist at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. He has studied drugs for 30 years, written over 200 articles in his first book, High Price, a, neuroscience, a neuroscientist's journey of self-discovery that challenges everything you know about drugs and society, won the Penn E.O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award. We love working with Penn at CAM. We invite you to use the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen to engage both Dr. Shedd and Dr. Hart in tonight's conversation. And more importantly, we urge you to purchase the book from SOM Books, our lovely uh, book partners for tonight's conversation. Um, we love working with SOM, happy to have them. And we hope that you'll be uh, patronizing their business for Dr. Hart's book. With that, I'll turn the conversation over to Dr. Shedd. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I am delighted to be here in conversation with my scholar, colleague, brother, friend, Dr. Carl Hart. We're gonna get right to it. Um, I think for many of us, this is a moment in a pandemic where we have to acknowledge the loss of life, um, the very real examination of inequality as it runs through public health, as we run through all types of supports and safety. And so this conversation may seem like a diversion to many, but I think it's central 
um, to what we're dealing with right now. And practically, some of you may have taken some drugs just to get through today and to show up in this virtual setting. So let's have a conversation about what that means. And I'm really delighted to be here at the beginning of this launch to start the conversation as a sociologist, I'm not a psychologist, very much as a sociologist to think about not just biology of drugs, but the environment. But in order for us to start this conversation on the same plane, I want Dr. Hart to start with your audience that you are not addressing or the topics that are not for this conversation, because I think it will help us really hone into what the key arguments are in your work and for us to have a real conversation. So who is not the target of this book? Please tell us. Yeah, like, uh, thank you, Carla. And thank you for agreeing to do this um, um, because you know, uh, I really love you. So thank you for doing this. Um, the, the book is not for uh, children. Um, and as the title says, uh, uh, this is drug use for grownups and growing up is difficult and it's not guaranteed. Just like this book is, is not guaranteed or not for everyone, growing up is not for everyone. So um, I'm really talking about responsible adults here, people who meet their obligations, uh, they take care of their families, they uh, contribute to their communities, um, uh, they pay their taxes, they um, don't uh, incite uh, insurrections in the country, you know, those kinds of responsible adults. That's who I am talking to. Uh, and I am not talking about drug addiction. Uh, I'm not talking about drug addiction because drug addiction um, uh, supplants and hijacks most of the conversation that deals with drugs, uh, even though the vast majority of people who use any drug ranging from marijuana to heroin. Uh, the vast majority of those, the folks who use those drugs are not addicts, but almost all of the conversation around drugs deals with addiction. So just like imagine if uh, all the conversation about automobiles dealt with car crashes, that would be ridiculous, but that's what we do with drugs. And so I'm trying to have a conversation uh, with adults uh, about drugs in a grown-up sort of manner. Uh, and I'm trying to have a conversation with people about liberty and what that really means. Like in the United States, we say these jingoistic statements like, uh, we promise life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is some profound uh, stuff. You know, uh, the forefathers, they were flawed, of course. But these principles are uh, profound because what, what that essentially says, it guarantees all of us as citizens, those three birthrights, at least those three birthrights. And that means that you can live your life as you see fit, so long as you don't interfere with other people's ability to do the same. Um, and when it comes to what we put in our bodies, it seems like we have sacrificed that. Like we've just given up that liberty. And I'm saying, hold up, let's check this out. Because if we're giving up this liberty, liberty, what other liberties are we giving up? And to be clear, uh, when we're talking about liberties being given up, uh, uh, Black people are going to have their liberties taken away first and more fierce than anybody in, in this country at least. And so, um, so I want to have this discussion. I want to, I want people to really consider their liberty. Okay, this is, you know, a great starting point, especially as you're centering race and particularly black people. And so for the California African American Museum, and for those who are in the audience today, how might we think of pursuing liberty, pursuing happiness, through the use of drugs? I mean, what does it mean to have as an end game perhaps or the end result be happiness? Is it euphoria? Is it being high? And why do you see drug use as the means by which it's a, it's a portal to fulfilling those aims that you say the founding fathers set out as ideals and aspirations? Yeah, um, so I'm using drug use as an example. 
uh, to help people examine their liberty uh, and their pursuit of happiness um, because I study drugs and I know drug, I know this topic better than I know any other topic. And so I'm using this, we can use a number of other uh, topics. We can use uh, sex, gambling. We can use a number of these sort of other topics. Guns, uh, about guns too, yes. Guns, uh, that's right. We can use all of these topics, but I'm an expert on drugs. And so th that's why I'm staying with drugs. And so when we think about what's happiness, now the Declaration of Independence doesn't guarantee us happiness. All it does is guarantee us the pursuit of happiness. Doesn't mean that we'll be happy. Um, and so however we think we might be happy, uh, that's happiness. Uh, for me, for example, happiness might look different than it may look for you. Um, uh, for me, happiness is sometimes uh, chilling with a nice psychoactive substance on board and uh, reading a, a good book or writing a book. Um, that's happiness to me. Okay, so as a psychologist, and I can think about the very individualist perspective, but as a sociologist, I want you to address what it means to pursue happiness in a moment when that pursuit could be criminalized on the basis of your identity, on the basis of the environment in which you live. And so please connect the dots between your first amazing book, High Price, to the lingering questions and perhaps the truths that you are now able to reveal in this sub subsequent work about, this is not just about biology and individuals pursuing happiness. This is about the reception of these behaviors and whether or not they will be received positively by the state, by their communities, by families. And so what is the social part of this? And tell me why you can pursue the argument even knowing that there is a differential response to black people pursuing liberty. I mean, this is why I study criminalization and I don't study crime. Well, um, I wanna Car think about- Carla, Carla. Slow down. You you gave me a lot to think about there. So let's just hold up. Let, let's 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 that's a great question, and you got a lot more to ask about that. But um, let's think about uh, this issue in terms of the social context, right? Um, so let me use one example. I'll use the example that a lot of Black folks know about. That's the crack sort of scare everybody talked about in the uh, mid '80s. Um, in 1986, we passed laws that punished crack cocaine violations 100 times more harshly than powder uh, cocaine violations. Uh, it, that meant that people were required to go to jail for small amounts of crack for a minimum of five years. To trigger the same sentence for powder cocaine, one had to have 100 times more powder cocaine. Now, the thinking was that Crack cocaine use was associated with black folks, whereas powder cocaine use was associated with wealthier white folks. And so people said, then uh, so what we saw were, um, oh, nearly 90% of the people who were arrested in the early days, the up and throughout the early 90s, uh, who were arrested under these laws for crack were black. So that's like 90%. Now, the majority of crack users were white. I mean, just by sheer numbers in this country, black people only make up 12%. Uh, so that's, this is a simple thing, but the public perception was that black people use the drug more. And that's why we have those arrests. No, we had those arrests because we put law enforcement resources into black communities. And also um, it was a lot easier to arrest folks who had no resources and they had limited sort of support to have a defense. Uh, you can harass those people. Now, when these laws, when, when this law was first passed in 86, September 8, 1986, uh, James Baldwin gave a talk uh, at the press club in Washington DC in December 86. James Baldwin predicted what would happen with this law, this new tough law? Because uh, black politicians supported this law. Uh, 80 to 90% of them supported this law. 
And James Baldwin was saying that the black politician should work to legalize drugs because as long as we have drug prohibition, the people who are going to pay are the black brown folks disproportionately so. Uh, a lot of white folks are paying the price too. Um, um, and, and, but so the point is, is that where we choose to put our resources, our law, our law enforcement resources, is where we get our arrests. Now, a lot of black folks were calling for uh, the police to be in these communities. Um, uh, and um, they were also calling for jobs, uh, better education, healthcare, a number of things. But the only thing that they got were the police. Mm. And what we see now is the result of that. We have more than 2 million people in jail or in prison behind bars. Uh, and so and a large proportion of them, well, black men, for example, make up 6% of the general population. They make up damn near 40% of the prison population because where we choose to put out law enforcement resources, particularly when it comes to drug law enforcement. Now you take, you put that all in context, when you consider that as the backdrop to what the Declaration of Independence guarantees us. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Why are you arresting people for what they choose to put in their own bodies if they are not bothering anybody or preventing anybody from enjoying their liberties? It's silly. And I'm trying to point this out to the public now, and we can go through the different sort of drug classes because people will say, what about addiction? What about this? Uh, uh, the vast majority of people who use drugs are not addicted. And when we look at drug addiction, people are addicted because of those psychosocial reasons that you kind of were alluding to. Uh, lack of jobs, lack of opportunities, lack of social skills, lack of skills in general. All of these things are complicated and complex, but to blame drugs, that's really simple because as a politician, you can just say, oh, we'll, we're gonna remove crack from your community, put more police on the street. It's a win-win for politicians because what they do is that they can increase their support in uh, say like, um, working class white communities where the factories have all left. Mm -hmm. uh, those, the mills, the, fa uh, the paper mills, they're gone. Uh, the uh, automobile factories, they're gone. Uh, and so you got to replace them with some jobs. Law enforcement, the prison industry. So you build the prisons and you got to put people there. And uh, we know who's there. And so, so I'm, trying, I'm trying to get people to think, I'm trying to get people to understand that this focus on drugs is irrational. And not only is it, is it irrational, particularly for black people, we are signing the death certificate of our children. Can you talk about perhaps the complementary nature of you putting forward your arguments around drug use and what it means to be a functioning adult and pursuing happiness and thinking about this response of the state. And I could use California or many other places in our country as examples of the kind of uneven <laughs> regulation, decriminalization, legalization of drugs yeah. across the spectrum. So yeah. we can say there's no stigma perhaps in California to using recreational marijuana, whereas New York and New York City, New York State is not there yet, but our governor just said, hey, I'm gonna start to do this because we need the money from it. It's not because of, hey, this is the best thing for people or it shouldn't be criminalized. So can we think about the unequal and uneven um, enforcement of these laws that will come into contact, I think, with the arguments you're making about liberty and freedom, because you can do this particular drug in California, but you're unable to do it in New York. So how can we have this sort of generalist argument knowing that there's a differential response? 
Yeah, thank you, Carla. Uh, you, let, so let's unpack that a little bit. Um, I love listening to you lecture, you know. Uh, uh, we'll unpack that a bit. Um, when we think about, let's just think about the states that have legalized uh, recreational marijuana, right? New Jersey was the most recent, I believe. And uh, New Jersey has the highest proportion of black people uh, of all of the sort of legalized states. So if you look at the states that have legalized uh, marijuana, uh, California, I think they have like 6%. You, you have 6% of black folks. Uh, Washington, they may have 3%. Colorado, the same thing. Um, uh, so you could kind of map marijuana legalization based on the state's black population. Uh, um, and so New, New Jersey is uh, an anomaly. And the only reason that New York is legalizing marijuana is because New Jersey did it. And we're not gonna let New Jersey take those revenues when we know that people would much more prefer to be in New York. So, uh, and they could buy their marijuana in, in, in New York. That's the real reason that we are legalizing in, in New York. Um, now, the point of that is that one of the easiest ways to get probable cause uh, is to say that you smelt marijuana. So in legalized states, that probable cause is taken away. And so now cops can't use that oftentimes bogus excuse to harass people. And so um, um, I would predict that marijuana legalization for recreational use is not gonna happen in the South for some time, in large part because the South has higher black population proportions. And so um, uh, I, I think this is an important tool for law enforcement. Uh, so when we say like, well, okay, given that we know that black people might be disproportionately targeted, how can I, for example, say, um, hey, you should be using substances if you want to. When I know police might be targeting you more than someone else. Well, the same thing could be said or asked of our civil rights heroes in the past. They put themselves on the line to prove a point to make the country live up to its noble ideals, its promise, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, to make its practice match its promise. Um, and so I am saying that, yeah, you still have to stand up. You know, you still have to uh, put it on the line uh, for future generations, uh, for your children, um, for uh, 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 the folks who will come after us. Uh, and so I, I don't, um, uh, I, I, I can't say that I have a, a, some magic wand to fix the current problems in society because they are here mm -hmm. uh, and I have to deal with it. And, um, but I believe in uh, people's liberty. I believe in protecting people's liberty because I want them to protect mine. Um, and so that means that if I have to go to jail for using drugs, um, and I'm not bothering anyone. Oh, uh, uh, I will. I will do that as an act of civil disobedience. It's my right to put in my body what I choose to put into my body. So walk me through this journey. Um, you know, as an ethnographer who takes very seriously people's stories and their lives, as a Columbia professor you know, tenured full professor, acclaimed scientist, how can you sort of reconcile your identity as a black man, as you call yourself a dreadlock in the book um, and, and walking into this world? I mean, people, Carl is tall, he's brown skin, you know, how do you sort of reconcile your identity and say, I could put myself on the line while also thinking about your privilege. Um, and, and tell us about this journey because it's been 
you know, uh, different levels of disclosure, whether we're talking about types of drugs that you've been studying or testing, as well as how you've let us into your personal life and your personal journey. So for people who haven't read the book yet or who know of your earlier book, but just walk us through what you've decided to open up in this, in this book. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um... So with the last book, High Price, it took me all around the world, you know, from the Philippines to Ghana, to South Africa, to Brazil, to Northern Ireland, all around the world. And what I, have, what I was seeing was um, all of these people being vilified, being persecuted for merely being uh, outed as a drug user. Um, and I didn't think that was right, uh, I, good people. Uh, and then also I knew there were a lot of privileged people who used the same drugs and they weren't being outed and they were enjoying their privilege, as you say. Um, and so I had, to, I, had to, I had to look in the mirror, take a hard long look in the mirror and be like, I, I was like, well, what kind of man am I? Am I living like the man that I think I am? And I wasn't. And so um, I thought that uh, all of my heroes, Ida B. Wells, uh, Rosa Parks, all of those folks, uh, they put themselves on the line so that I might be able to enjoy uh, the promise uh, of the Declaration of Independence. Um, and so uh, I felt like a coward if I didn't do the same thing in my way. And this is one of the way with drugs, I'm an expert in drugs and I know drugs really well. And I know uh, the nonsense that people say about drugs. So bring that on. Um, and then I can deal with those arguments. That's, so that's great. Uh, if, this, if we were talking about uh, selling sex, which I think people should have the right to do, uh, I would know less about it because I'm not an expert there. But I think people should have the right to do that. Uh, that's their body, that's their decision, that's their choice. Why are we in this mix? Uh, why is the state in that mix? It doesn't make any sense for uh, adults. And so looking in the mirror, um, it became really easy. After traveling all around the world where you see uh, black people, brown people, white people, poor, the poor, all of them, they have, the thing that they have in common is that they were poor. And they were being persecuted, vilified, merely for using drugs. And, you know, I go to a place like Northern Ireland, it's, it's all white. Uh, but the same problems that we have here in New York, they were having in Northern Ireland, Ireland for the same reasons. Um, uh, this oppressive state um, uh, vilifying a certain group uh, in that community the connections were uh, so clear and obvious. Um, I had an opportunity to see all of this big picture. And so I had an opportunity to tell the world about it. And so this is what I wrote about. And, um, and so I'm here to uh, hopefully um, stand by those people's side, those people who are catching hell simply because they use drugs. Now, one of the aims of the book you say is you want people to come out of the closet. And can you perhaps even walk us through how you think that disclosure might matter, especially in this pandemic where I think from my yeah. point of view, I've been hearing people talk about, oh, the wine moms and the, you know, C, um, CBD, CBD is now legal and people will talk about that, but they haven't gotten into, hey, opioids, that's my thing. So can you even talk about yeah. the sort of continuum of, drugs where if we want to talk about sugar or we want to talk about food if we want to talk about you know the legalized alcohol tobacco whatever to then thinking about the end game the the opioids the psychedelics um all of these things can you walk us through how we even can conceive of your argument if we're still stuck at the early sort of yeah. acceptable levels of drugs yeah, so let's think about marijuana. Um, marijuana, it, it's 
it's acceptable to say that you smoke marijuana, right? Even uh, Bill Clinton, well, uh, in, in 92, Bill Clinton could not say he smoked. Uh, but then uh, by the time Barack Obama had become president, you know, he was asked, well, did you inhale? Because Bill Clinton said, well, I, 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 I smoked, but I didn't inhale, you know, uh, which was the stupidest shit. I mean, it was silly, right? Um, so Barack Obama, when he was asked that question, he was like, that was the point. You know, he could say that in 2008. He could say that that was the point and, and people would laugh and not vilify him because marijuana had become acceptable, right? Um, uh, and Barack Obama could also say, yeah, I use cocaine too. Because even cocaine use in the past during your youth is considered acceptable. So there are like these uh, gradations that are acceptable. Like marijuana use present is okay. Uh, psilocybin use or the other psychedelic use, they're okay. Uh, CBD use is okay. So we have this sort of uh, arbitrary uh, distinction that we make with these substances. Um, when we think about alcohol, alcohol is legal. Alcohol is potentially one of the most toxic substances that we have. And this is not making an argument to restrict alcohol because I, you know, I love to periodically uh, 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 drink that anxiety uh, relieving beverage when I don't have anything better. <laughs> Uh, but I try and make that as infrequent as possible because there are so many better things and we can talk about that later. Uh, but, um, but when we think about these arbitrary distinctions, um, it, they don't make any sense from a pharmacological perspective, from a science perspective. Uh, and so when we think about things that don't make any sense, then we have to ask the questions, wait, wait, hold up why are drugs illegal in the first place? And it's like, oh, American racism, that's really easy. I mean, we could think about um, from alcohol prohibition to uh, banning cocaine to banning opioids. With alcohol, we really didn't like the Germans. Uh, many of the Germans, they uh, owned uh, breweries and uh, they were in the alcohol business. Uh, and uh, that really pushed alcohol prohibition over the top. So we, this is amazing. We passed an amendment to uh, prohibit alcohol, um, the 18th Amendment. And it was passed in um, um, uh, 1919, but took effect 1920, uh, but it was overturned in 1933. It's the only amendment that was overturned because it was silly. Uh, and but we went on with that uh, silly uh, experiment for 14 years or so. Uh, uh, now, uh, when we think about cocaine, uh, uh, cocaine was banned largely because of its association uh, with black people. Not that black people were using cocaine more than white folks. That's the, the that has never been the case. But um, people in the South started to associate heinous crimes with black people. And you started seeing this in the newspapers, in the scientific literature, uh, ridiculous claims that were being made like, like uh, cocaine gave black people superhuman strength such that you can shoot them six times with a 32 caliber weapon and not drop them. You know, uh, ridiculous today, but someone was writing in a scientific journal publishing that nonsense. And it was effective because it got cocaine banned. And with, uh, when we think about the opioids, uh, our racism towards the Chinese uh, uh, banned, we got us to ban uh, the opioids. And so uh, we don't ban drugs for pharmacological reasons. We ban drugs for sociological reasons for our uh, racism. And so when you look at this history, as black folks or people who have been uh, 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 vilified in this society, why in the world would you wanna have more restrictions that could be used against you when the Declaration of Independence guarantees you certain liberties? 
I don't, and so in writing this book, I came to this realization, you know, like me, I was studying drugs for like 30 years, thinking that I was doing something good by focusing on crack addiction. Mm -hmm. When people don't have jobs, people don't have skills. It's like, uh, it's ridiculous. It's one of these things where we can blame drugs when we want to scapegoat something. When the factories move to other countries and these businesses are not held responsible, uh, you pit groups against each other and politicians, they win, win, win. Well, how do you sort of deal with people saying, okay, that's people's right to use drugs, but I also am dealing with the effects. If I go downtown to LA Skid Row, or if I think about Harlem and 125th Street and Park, you know, I can see the effects of drug use gone to a different level. And so then you get, again, like you said, the media portrayals, but I'm really thinking about the impact on those who are most vulnerable. And so yeah. how can we separate these sorts of ideas from the realities of what is going to be most poignant to people if we know psychology, that these you know, extremes are what will stick? Thank you, Carla, you giving me these softball questions. Uh, you know that, uh, but that's great. That's great uh, because we got to make sure we have people to uh, think. Now, you said that we're looking at the effects on places like Skid Row, right? The Skid Row and various places in Harlem or so forth uh, where people are having a difficult time. Um, you're not looking at the effects of drugs. You're looking at the effects of mental health issues. You're looking at the effects of a wide range of things. Drugs, again, are scapegoated. Um, uh, you, you see this, for example, in Vancouver, um, um, uh, uh, the downtown east side, they call it. The same sort of thing, except all those folks are white. Uh, but it's the same thing. And you have these mental health problems that the society hasn't dealt with. And if people use drugs, some of them, uh, they use drugs and you say, oh, that's a drug problem. That's not a drug problem. You know this because the vast majority of people who use drugs don't have problems. And you also know this because, uh, you know, uh, I've traveled around the world and I've gotten high with a number of people who are captains of industry. Um, and there are far more drugs in those sort of wealthy communities. Um, and those wealthy communities, they're doing fine. Um, uh, and so um, uh, to uh, misattribute what's going on to drugs uh, uh, misses the boat and it, uh, keeps us in this, uh, it keeps us chasing our tail. Okay. So let's get back to your point about efficiency. And I'll bring up an anecdote from when I brought you to my class when I was a <laughs> professor at your employer, uh, assistant <laughs> professor, very new. And I was teaching a course called Crime, Law and Society. I later renamed it Race, Crime, and Law because students were surprised I talked about race a lot. Um, so I had to do some selection on who showed up. But when you came to that course and I just thought, why not call in one of my brilliant colleagues to do this you know, lecture about the war on drugs and reefer madness and show his slides on how we've sort of moved through time with drug policy and drug use. However, <laughs> I was clutching my pearls when you mentioned efficiency and you were like, why would you smoke the drug? If you want it to be efficient, you got us snorted or shoot it up. And I just, I mean, I almost lost my mind because all I could think about was my evaluations are going to say Dr. Shedd had a professor come in and tell us to shoot up drugs. And I was stressed out, I will say. Um, so even having this conversation now where we're both grown, uh, <laughs> I have tenure at a different institution um, and, and acknowledging this reality, but like, how do you think about the audience and sort of how you're getting at these real norms for what should be and how we can receive it? 
Yeah, Colin, you know you're my measuring stick, right? Because you're that story that you told about the class. Uh, I wrote about it, but it didn't make the book because I didn't write about it as well. That was on me. And so uh, don't worry, it's still there. And it, I'm, I'm working, I'm working that story because it was so funny, actually. Um, I was there just being a pharmacologist and trying to help people to understand the different routes of administration. You know, just trying to make sure the students understand biology. That, that's what I was trying to do. So if somebody is, is smoking a drug like crack, like you lose some of it by burning it, smoking it. And I was suggesting that if you shoot it intravenously, you don't lose any because it all goes into the bloodstream. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get the drug into the bloodstream because before a drug can act, it has to enter the bloodstream. So when you take it orally, um, it has to go through the stomach first uh, before uh, passing through the liver where some of it gets broken down and you lose some. And so that's not the most efficient way. And so I was telling your students this and just this sort of intellectual sort of geeky thing and uh, not even thinking about that um, uh, somebody might be clutching their pearls uh, in that situation because um, in academe, I thought all ideas are on the table. You know, uh, and, and so, and the best idea is win, that's it. Um, and so, um, as you can see, I'm, I, I get excited to talk about this now. So, um, uh, yeah, that, 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 so like I said, you're, you're my measuring stick. When I think about the audience, like this thing tonight, um, I wanted to have you because I knew that you would make sure I didn't like get it off into my own world and, and forget about the audience. And sometimes I, I do that because, um, you know how we do, we get intensely focused on some topic and um, um, sometimes forget that everybody is not living and breeding drugs 24 hours a day like I am. So, yeah. So I have to think about the audience. I, 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 I do, you know, um, everybody knows about an alcohol buzz. They know about relaxation. Um, and then I can tell them like, hey, yo, you know, there are better highs than that. And so read the book you'll find this out. Uh, and so everybody wants to know, wait, you got something that can enhance empathy, euphoria, uh, understanding, openness, uh, patience, uh, you know, so there are substances uh, that could be used in ways that help people to meet their goals for that moment. Um, and that's the beautiful thing. That's the beauty of pharmacology. Without pharmacology, we don't have local anesthetics like cocaine. We don't, uh, cocaine was the first local anesthetic. Um, uh, without cocaine, we don't have Novocaine. We don't have lidocaine. So you go to the dentist and you don't have uh, relief from pain. Mm -hmm. So thank God we have cocaine. Uh, without the opioids, uh, you don't have those great sort of general pain relievers. Um, and so when people start saying that some drugs are evil, bad, drugs are not evil or bad or good or any of those things, they're just neutral. Um, and and they, are, they can't be activated until they interact with a biological system. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I get excited about that. Well, I'm thinking, you know, even of these examples and the kind of social activation that I hear because, you know, one of my last trips to the dentist, I needed a filling and I was still feeling pain. And I thought that this white dentist not give me enough of the anesthetic because I'm black, you know, so I'm sitting here as a patient thinking of these social ramifications when I just want you to do your job properly. And so you mentioned some of this in the book where you talk about disclosure and you're going to handle perhaps a checkup at the doctor and wondering about social reactions to, can I truly say that I am high right now or I've used a drug in the past 24 hours. And so can we talk about that? What it means to sort Absolutely. of deal with these interactions between Absolutely. what we know about drugs and our personal identities? Absolutely. Uh, so let's just go back to that anecdote where I was uh, in the doctor's office and I was getting a colonoscopy. Um, this, is, this happens when you hit 50. Uh, and so 
Um, I was faced with the question, um, uh, the nice young nurse asked, uh, uh, did I use drugs? And I was faced with this question about, do I be, uh, should I be honest about the extent of my drug use? And then um, in the end, you know, uh, to get to the punchline, uh, I had had enough of being, uh, of deceiving people about this and lying and being dishonest. So. I, I I disclosed everything and uh, and and but the the thing is is this like I wouldn't be high at a doctor's appointment uh, that's a waste of your high why would anybody who is responsible do something like that um, you know you want to be psychoactively altered in your space and where you have time and space. You don't want to be out in public that or uh, I mean, um, at least most people don't want to do that kind of thing. Uh, and so that's not how I get down. Um, um, uh, I think about these things in uh, the same way I think about many activities that I do in my life. They are private and they are uh, my moments and my time. I, I uh, set aside time for these activities just like I set aside time to write, uh, to study, to do all these things. Um, the same is true with, with drug use. Um, um, uh, I've never had a problem with drugs, uh, um, whereas I've had a problem with my colleagues and uh, being an administrator and all the rest of those things. Those things are far more detrimental to my health than drugs have ever been. So you're saying drug use is an escape from um, administrative life. <laughs> no, 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 not an escape, not an escape. You know, um, that's not, that's because, you know, it's, you have to deal with that. You know this, you and I both, we are in these same institutions. We, you know, it's part of life. Uh, you deal with difficult people, difficult situations, and you try and do it with some amount of compassion. Uh, and then particularly when you're a senior, uh, you're more senior, you, you want to make sure that your interaction with junior people does not poison their subsequent interactions with their loved ones. I mean, you wanna make sure you don't uh, uh, do those kinds of things. And so you are there, you have to be present. It's work, that's why you get paid to do it. Um, and drug use is, my drug use is like uh, comedy. Uh, when I go see live comedy shows, uh, it's nice to laugh and enjoy myself. Um, Nobody would say, oh, you're going to see Dave Chappelle to escape. What? You, you know? Um, no. I mean, Dave Chappelle might be dropping some knowledge that I really want to hear. And when I use certain substances, I can think about certain problems in a new way, um, uh, oftentimes a helpful way. So, I mean, there is a question in the box where they ask, you know, is drug use an escape and liberty from an oppressive society? And I'm wondering how on a trajectory of use of drugs and there are people who go along the trajectory and function and there are those who go on a different trajectory yeah. and it becomes abuse. And I'm wondering at the sort of connecting points before paths diverge. Yeah. What is there? Is it pain versus pleasure? Is it some other way that we can think about the origins of the, you know, turn and use from to abuse or use to just use? Yeah. So how do you explain these different paths? Yeah, no, that's a good one. Um, so I want to say a little something about vulnerability first because you, you raised that point earlier and then we'll talk about the divergent paths and so like there are a number of people who say they're concerned about vulnerable populations right um and for example we see a lot of these kids they are college students and they want to go to the hood uh, and teach for america whatever they do now whatever is popular or hot it's like no we don't need you there uh, stay out of those communities um uh, what you can do if you want to really help is get out of the closet, change the image of what a drug user looked like. Make sure that that image is more representative of what the actual picture is. 
um, that's what you can do to help. But stay out of the communities. Don't don't worry about those vulnerable people. And so when we talk about vulnerable, we have to make sure we 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 are defining what we are talking about. There are some people who are at risk because of some psychological issues that they haven't worked out and it would be nice if they can get the therapy, the help that they need. Um, uh, those psychological issues will make them more vulnerable. Uh, they should, uh, like I said, get the help uh, they need. Other people are at risk because they have uh, housing instability. Uh, they have economic instability. Uh, uh, the best thing for those people is to make sure they have housing, to make sure they have gainful employment. There are people who are at risk because they have lower levels of education. Um, the, the, the cure there is to make sure they have education. And so when we talk about these different vulnerabilities, we have to make sure that we are precise in, in what we are talking about because this generalized sort of thing uh, doesn't get you anywhere. I mean, you know, in science, we have to precisely define our problem and we go about trying to solve it. And, and, and so that's, that's important about vulnerabilities. But, but when we talk about these paths diverging, uh, the paths diverge for a number of reasons, a number of reasons that you as a sociologist are studying. Uh, this sort of psychosocial context uh, plays a huge role in um, uh, where these paths will go. Uh, you can imagine, for example, a kid getting arrested or a young person getting arrested for some drug, some drug charge. Uh, and you can pretty much predict what will happen to that child's future versus a child who was given a warning, given another opportunity, given an alternative to prison and those sorts of things. You can understand, you can clearly see how those paths can diverge. And oftentimes that happens. Um, so uh, the paths diverge for a variety of reasons. And there isn't one shoe that fits all. And the way you figure out what to do is to carefully study what's going on with the case that you're interested in and not make these broad generalizations. When you start to blame the drug itself, that prob that's a clue to you that you're probably wrong. Mm. Well, thank you for hinting at the work of my second project and tracking young people through the juvenile court system in New York City and obviously having the inability to track those who get warnings or who, who are never surveilled or never criminalized for the same behaviors as those who may show up in a juvenile delinquency courtroom. So, I mean, this is, this is totally clear in how we work through this. I'm wondering for the purposes of precision, and I love the various uses of evidence in this book where you show us chemical, molecular chemical structures of the drugs. You give us the sort of archival data that shows the progression. You give us um, different types of evidence, but much of what you use is personal. And so can you talk about the move from you know, having to rely on these objective sor sorts of sources of data to then think, okay, I'm going to go to the heart here. I'm going to expose what I do in my private life, talk about my family, talk about my walk in the world, and why you think that may be most impactful. Um, so the reason why I made it personal, really personal with my family and so forth, is because I wanted to humanize this story. I wanted people to, people can't say that I am some irresponsible degenerate. You know, I am one of the most productive people I know. Um, and I know a lot of productive people. Um, and so uh, I wanted to show people that their image of a drug user is wrong inconsistent with the evidence. And one way I had to do that was be deeply personal. Um, but also being deeply personal and using personal anecdote, uh, it, it was effective because you can tell a good story. 
But the anecdote itself is not enough to be evidence. And so uh, I tried to use divergent evidence um, to support that an anecdote. Um, so um, uh, for example, um, I've studied a drug like cocaine for a number of years. Uh, and I uh, watch people's ratings of euphoria, or their heart rate, their blood pressure, all this sort of stuff. And then, you know, if I didn't do cocaine, I hadn't done cocaine. I really don't know what that euphoria feels like compared to heroin euphoria. But, you know, you say, are you euphoric? Yes. Uh, at the cocaine, are you euphoric at the heroin? Yes. Uh, are those the same feelings? Of course not. Uh, they are slightly different, but you don't, we don't capture that sometimes as uh, precisely in the lab. And one of the things that personal anecdote helped me to do is to appreciate these uh, subtle uh, drug effects that we don't capture as well in the lab. Um, for example, I did a study comparing methamphetamine to MDMA. MDMA is called Molly and uh, uh, Adam or ecstasy, some people call it. And there were a lot of similarities in the effects that the drugs produced in the lab. And if I would have only taken those sort of evidence, I would have come away with the conclusion that methamphetamine and MDMA produce uh, almost identical effects. And anybody who's taken MDMA and methamphetamine would say, you don't know what, to, what you're talking about. Um, and so um, that personal experience helped me to see the subtle nuanced differences between the substances. Well, I mean, that's a slippery slope. I would not see, I don't think in my discipline, sociologists, you know, getting themselves locked up if they study crime or are you thinking about the sort of personal experience where some may say that distance is necessary but um you know wait, wait, hold up let's 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 dispel that myth right now yes. um so one of the things we do in science is we say that we're dispassionate objective and so forth that's not true i mean uh you study things that you're passionate about uh you just conceal your passion um, for example, if we had more black scientists studying drugs and biology and the brain and so forth, uh, I assure you that uh, our policies would be different. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, the most of the people who study drugs are uh, white scientists, uh, and that doesn't, doesn't mean that they're bad people or anything like I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is that the consequences of our drug policies do not impact them like they impact me. You know, uh, I have relatives, uh, friends uh, in prison um, um, who have been lost as a result of our approach to drugs in this society. And that really hurts. And so as a result, that drives what I do too. And, but those other sort of scientists who don't have that, um, uh, they don't care as much, but they do have their issues that they care about. Uh, and so uh, to say that uh, like you can't be objective, the kind of work that I do in science uh, has nothing to do with like me uh, uh, using drugs because uh, oftentimes like the drug that I'm studying I don't use, uh, uh, and not only that, um, I am so removed from the research, I just designed the studies. So I'm not there doing the day to day. Um, and you know, I'm helping with the writing of the paper, I designed the studies. Um, and so uh, the data are what they are and the research is peer reviewed. And so uh, um, other scientists will say whether the research is garbage, not good, and not publish it, or they'll say it's it's good, it's acceptable. Um, and so I don't determine that, the, the peers determine that. So, I mean, it's, it's important to hear, I think, critiques of the disciplines as you're talking about. If we change the makeup and the demographics, it would perhaps change the impact of this work and change policy. How might you, and this is something that's come up in the Q&A, um, they say, 
it's complex. We don't have a perfect, perfect world for free liberty and the use of drugs. So how do we sort of turn this information to the policymakers and to the sort of people who would be in charge of the restriction of these freedoms, of the criminalization of these behaviors? Like, is your book going to land um, on the desks of these governors in Florida or Mississippi who might then think differently about a drug and 10 years later, it's a, it's a different policy world. So how do you sort of move this conversation knowing that you're speaking to a very specific population when the power is in a different perhaps realm? Okay, so to be clear, like I didn't write this book for the policymakers. Uh, I really don't care what they think uh, because they, um, um, uh, they actually can follow the people people oftentimes. And so I wrote it for the people. I wrote it for uh, those folks who are feeling like outcasts, who are feeling vilified. And I wrote this book for them to say, yeah, I belong to my humanity matters too. And they, and so this is um, affirming their humanity. That's, that's one of the main reasons. And what I do on the public lecture circuit is to talk to the people, the voters. And my job is to convince the voters. And when the voters uh, get this, enough voters get this information and they see it be advantageous for them, then it will change. Until it happens, it won't change. And so the voters, the people who are listening tonight, they are the most important people, not the politicians. And so that's why I'm here as opposed to being in Washington or someplace like that. Um, so yeah, it, it's about the people and educating uh, the people. And it, this is a real opportunity for people to consider their liberty and what that means. Uh, and you know, like uh, Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. They made us learn that in middle school. They made us learn his speech for a reason. I think, you know, it, it's a reason because liberty is the most foundational, fundamental thing to us. Um, is it uh, uh, New Hampshire, I think, it's on their, their motto is live free or die. Uh, you know, this, this, those, are, those are some powerful and noble ideals. That's why it just blows my mind when Americans sacrifice their liberty without even thinking about that. They're but sacrificing my liberty. We have people using those same arguments um, saying they won't wear a mask, even though we're in the midst of a global pandemic. And they yeah. say, you know, you're restricting my liberty, trying to make me wear a mask. Or so, that's it, what people so, are saying different. around the Capitol. Um, that's on, different. That's all. Mask, and then we'll do Capitol. Mask first. OK. so. <laughs> Your liberty is protected so long as you are not preventing other people from pursuing their liberty. If you have COVID and you're spreading it in the, in, in the society, you're impacting my liberty. And so the society has to have these sort of rules to make sure that uh, we, are all, we can all enjoy liberties. It's not like, um, it's not like if you don't wear a mask, we're going to send you to jail, right? It's not that like that. Was, that was on the books too, though. <laughs> I mean, what well, those sorts of, you know, it, uh, we will uh, maybe uh, publicly shame you, but you're not going to have uh, any sanctions that going that are going to put you away like we do with drugs. Um, we have we restrict some liberties, like for example, driving an automobile. We require that you uh, pass a driving test, that you be of a certain age. We restrict that to adults for a reason, um, and we also have speed limits. But we don't ban driving. We just try to make the activity more safe. That's what we can do with drugs. But our current approach is actually making it more dangerous because whenever you make these things illegal, as we found out with alcohol prohibition, you increase the likelihood of having adulterants, contaminants in your product. So we had 
tens of thousands of people die and were maimed during prohibition because of tainted alcohol. We're seeing the same thing today because of tainted opioids. Um, these problems we have solutions to. They could go away. Have quality control. Legal regulation took care of it with alcohol. Legal regulation will take care of it with opioids. Now, can you speak specifically to some of the benefits of drugs? You say you want people to have the liberty to use them. And someone has asked, a few people have asked in the Q&A about, you know, you say some drugs could induce empathy or openness or yeah. other drugs may be um, a way of dealing with depression. So how do you sort of perhaps present the, the benefits? What is liberty the end in, end itself or is it something else? Is it just happiness? Is it? Um... No, I wouldn't do this if it, that wasn't, you know, a payoff. And the payoff is the psychoactive effects, the psychological effects of these substances. Um, that's one pay, uh, payoff. It's a major payoff. Um, you and I, we both have to go to these boring ass faculty receptions. Uh, and so um, uh, a benefit, um, you take a nice low dose of something, I don't know, uh, a low dose of an opioid combined with a low dose of a nice stimulant. Those people, they're cool. You can tolerate them. You have a nice time, uh, everything's good. Uh, we have alcohol in those settings. Why can't we do other drugs in those settings? Um, other drugs can facilitate social interactions, uh, facilitate more understanding. Um, um, uh, certainly can help me be more generous towards others. Um, uh, you know how it is when you are in these spaces it's quite competitive. And then you only are in that competitive mode and that's not good for anyone, but uh, bef uh, you know, we get caught up in it and some drugs can help you see that. And so you can help, they can help you see the humanity of others. Um, 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 you gotta read the book if you wanna really uh, know which drug for what specific situation, uh, it's all in the book. Okay, I mean, yeah, there are, many questions so definitely buy the books if you want to hear about psychedelics and their use um there are a few people asking about the educational force of your work and you know i'm thinking the public education of letting people know we shouldn't just be about decriminalization but legalization we should be more open to thinking about these things how do you see the sort of public education being fostered through this particular vehicle? Yeah, so let's think about the opioids and public education. Um, so uh, uh, we have uh, drug overdoses in the country and uh, the media always plays these tricks with the numbers. They'll have like this big number, 80,000, and then they'll talk about opioids. But then when you like look at the data, uh, you see like maybe 40 to 50,000 people die with an opioid in their system. And, um, uh, but we don't know exactly why they died, uh, in part because a large proportion of those individuals have multiple drugs in their system. What we do know, however, is that when you take opioids with some other sedatives like alcohol, uh, benzodiazepines like Xanax, uh, barbiturates, um, some nerve medication, the older antihistamines, they are um, quite good at uh, producing sedation. Uh, combined with a large dose of opioids, you run the risk of having respiratory depression and dying from an overdose. So part of the public education is to help people to understand that, yo, if you're going to be using opioids and you're inexperienced, you don't want to be mixing with alcohol. Uh, sometimes people use alcohol as just the background, like background noise. It's like you don't want to do that, particularly if you're inexperienced, because then you run the risk of uh, respiratory depression. Another sort of educational component of this is that a large proportion of people who are dying from overdoses 
do so because they, their drug was tainted with something like fentanyl. Fentanyl is a powerful, more powerful opi opioid. When I say more powerful, I mean more potent, and that simply means that less of the amount of the drug is needed to produce an effect, including overdose. Uh, so if someone takes heroin, uh, if they take fentanyl thinking it's heroin alone, uh, they may take too much of that, uh, thinking that uh, this is a typical dose of heroin that I take. So uh, it's heroin, but when in fact it's fentanyl and they may overdose. And so a large proportion of, of people uh, don't know what their drugs contain. Now, this is so easily solvable in Spain, in the Netherlands, uh, in Austria, a number of countries they have these services where people can submit small samples of their drugs and get a chemical printout, of, uh, uh, chemical composition of uh, uh, the analysis that will tell them everything that's in the substance. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have something in your substance that is potentially toxic, you don't take it. And if the substance isn't what you think it is, you don't take it. Uh, we have the technology to do this. This is simple. Uh, other countries do it because they care first about their citizens' health. They understand, just like we do, but we pretend not to, people are going to get high. That's a fact. So let's just take that off the table and figure out how we make this thing as safe as possible. Mm. So I think in terms of the message getting out, someone is asked in the chat, why didn't you title it substance use? Because of the stigma, I think of the word drug. And so substance could be an umbrella term for both legal and illegal for, you know, what is less stigmatized versus more stigmatized. How do you think even okay. just semantics might uh, matter? Yeah, I'm not, that's, that's, I'm not quibbling with that kind of stuff uh, because uh, the ideas in this book are so big. Uh, 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 drug versus substance, uh, no. Um, I use them interchangeably. I've been studying drugs forever. Um, it doesn't matter uh, if I say, uh, oh, heroin is a substance versus it's a drug. People will have still have the same uh, feeling about it. Or if I say, um, uh, Prozac is a substance and not a drug, they're still going to feel whatever they feel about Prozac. And so, uh, come on, uh, we're talking about liberty, uh, these big ideas. And in terms of the involvement of the state, um, how might you think of the regulation, as you said, having consistency in the makeup of the drugs, this, you know, even the accounting of the chemical sort of inclusions in the drug, who would do this? And how might you think of our current versions of the USDA or the FDA or other regulatory bodies to then make this in alignment with what you think it should be in terms of people's yeah. use? So um, the DEA and the, we, we have this technology already, so they could technically do some of this uh, but people would be suspect because it's a law enforcement agency and they may not want to submit there. But uh, one of the things that I'm going to try and do with this book tour is to raise enough money so we can do the testing here at Columbia as part of research to find out where are you more likely to get tainted drugs from which regions of New York you're more likely to get uh, tainted substances versus uh, uh, substances that are less stepped on, as they say. Uh, and so um, uh, that's, a, that's a line of research that I want to pursue next. Ooh, my head just started hurting thinking about IRB, the Institutional <laughs> Research Boards, but you've dealt with them pretty well to get to your you know, point where you can study drugs and, and think about this, but um, that's another kind of regulatory. No, but, but that's a great point, and I didn't even mention that. Um, this is the thing, uh, for the past uh, 22 years, um, I've been given drugs at Columbia, drugs like crack cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamine, MDMA, to research participants. And I've been doing it um, uh, as a result of the generous 
taxpayer dollars uh, that we get from our grants. Um, and so uh, when we say that these things are so dangerous, if they were so dangerous, why would you allow folks to give these drugs uh, to people? Uh, because we have misled the population uh, and we have exaggerated the potential harms associated with them. Not to say that harm is, is, is not a potential because it is, um, and, but we know how to reduce harm. And we certainly do this uh, every day in our laboratories here at Columbia. Uh, we don't have those kind of problems uh, here at uh, uh, giving drugs in the laboratory here. Uh, because we, we um, incorporate the knowledge that we have gained uh, and we can share it with the public. And that's what I'm trying to do with this book. Okay. So in light of our audience, and I think we're coming toward the end of the conversation, can you say, you know, what this work means for Black America in particular, knowing yeah. that, you know, we are the most vulnerable and in other ways, you know, the, the most amazing <laughs> uh, um, group to consider in terms of visibility and invisibility, in terms of criminalization, but also exceptionalism, if we think about your particular trajectory. And so how do you think with this audience tonight and with, you know, the target of your book and you yourself, um, how do you sort of see this having a lasting impact of, of changing the world of, of Black America in particular? So when I think about how my work makes contact with Black America, um, one of the things that we have done uh, here at Columbia uh, is that we did a lot of work with studying crack cocaine. And what we showed was um, that um, unlike the mythology surrounding crack, like one hit, you're addicted. Um, uh, if you give a, somebody who is addicted to crack cocaine an opportunity to smoke a rock versus anything else, they're gonna choose that rock. Uh, we have destroyed those kind of myths, right? And we have provi we provided some of the evidence that helped uh, to modify that law that that punished crack cocaine violations a hundred times more harshly than powder cocaine violation. Like data from our laboratories uh, contributed to bringing that law uh, in, uh, 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 into a more reasonable perspective. Although uh, uh, crack cocaine is still punished 18 times more harshly than powder cocaine, when in fact it should be one to one. Uh, because Obama, um, he let us down on that one. He said that he was going to make it one to one, uh, but he uh, he didn't have the political will to to push for what it should be. And when I say what it should be, uh, I say that because even till this day, eighty percent of the people who are arrested under those laws are black, even though the majority of crack users are white. Uh, and so those sorts of things are still in effect. And so I hope that this sort of stuff that I'm doing helps people to make arguments, convince their family members um, that it wasn't drugs that caused this person's problem. Look deeper into what was going on in that person's life. Uh, and uh, when you, uh, so I hope they are less likely to scapegoat, scapegoat drugs. And then that would uh, uh, put the onus back on the federal government uh, on our society. Uh, we pay our taxes. Uh, we deserve to have, uh, enjoy the benefits of those taxes, just like everyone else. Uh, and, uh, so I, that's, those are some ways I hope that this helps uh, the conversation. But the bigger point is that I want them to think about their own liberty. I want them to, uh, I want this, this audience to, to, to uh, uh, understand that they deserve the right to pursue happiness. They deserve to have liberty. Uh, they deserve to live their life as they see fit, so long as they don't bother other people or prevent other people from doing the same. 
how can you think that you have the right to live your life as you see fit when you want to lock somebody up for doing something that's not bothering you? What kind of society is that? So I hope that we come away from this conversation wanting to be better people. Well, I appreciate the work and I appreciate the, the passion. I think you're pushing boundaries in a way that's necessary, particularly in a moment where we have uh, potentially, hopefully, a new administration that was very involved in draconian sorts of policies that maybe this can land with them a different way. So let's see if President Biden and um, Vice President Harris might get a copy of your book too. And, and it's a different conversation um, now. But thank you for letting me join well, you. Our, our Madam Vice President and I, uh, she recently published a book. Um, she and I, we have the same editor. So I will tell Scott Moyers, if you out there, uh, to get uh, Vice, Vice President, uh, Madam Vice President, a copy of my book. Incredible. Well, I hope we all will get a copy of the book. Um, tonight's conversation has surely been a reason if you weren't interested before in purchasing it. I, I mean, we're all just so enthralled in the conversation and in the many provocative points made here this evening. Um, please purchase it via SO1 Books. As I mentioned, I put the link to purchase um, in the question and answer section for another guest that asked. Um, please do follow both Dr. Shedd and Dr. Hart on social media. Um, also check out Dr. Hart's um, other um, book talks this week. He was on Joe Rogan's podcast today, I believe, which I heard, heard was yes. incredible. I didn't get to check that out, but I'm sure it was great. Um, also we'll be in conversation with Dr. Melissa Harris Perry later this week um, with the uh, pros and I'm forgetting the name of the organization in Washington, DC. But Politics sure to and pros. Politics and prose, yes, love the bookstore. Uh, thank you so much. So thank you both for an insightful, enjoyable uh, conversation, super informed, uh, love learning about the subject. Um, we look forward to welcoming you back to CAM in person when it's safe to do so. And we finally reopen, hopefully this year at some point. Um, I will be delighted to be there. Absolutely lovely, incredible. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, on everybody on the East Coast, West Coast. Everybody be safe. Enjoy your night, and we'll uh, hopefully see you soon. Thank everybody. you, Carla. Thank you very much. Thank you both.